the clubs are really out to protect themselves and these rules are evolving. Almost the best case scenario for the Premier League that they win the case that they brought is a disaster for the Premier League. We've ended up with a kind of Frankenstein regime. The only sanction that is reasonable is an immediate points deduction. We then win our appeal and have the verdict overturned. What then? Very wealthy individuals completely lose their heads. Do you believe that City are guilty and do you believe they'll be found guilty? Two separate questions. Hello and welcome back to Typical City. Financial fair play and 115 charges being levelled at Manchester City has been a hot topic on this channel. So rather than getting a YouTube expert that's got their degree on Wish.com, I thought I'd get an actual expert onto the show in Stefan Borson, football financial expert and former financial advisor to Manchester City. How are you doing, Stefan? You okay? Yeah, good, thanks. How good, are you doing? Good. Yeah, really good. Thanks for coming onto the channel. Really, really appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about yourself quickly and your background to Manchester City, because I believe you handled the auction sale between Taskin Shinawatra and eventually getting into the hands of Sheikh Mansour. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, uh, lifelong City fan. So yeah, uh, first season, 82-83, when we got relegated. Right. Uh, uh, Luton and uh, uh, sort of vivid memories of of that pain straight away in my city history. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in Manchester and uh, then uh, qualified as a lawyer and then went off to London to work in investment banking. And during that time, advised uh, John Wardle's retail company, JD Sports, which obviously everybody knows. Uh, and managed to uh, wheedle my way into advising City um, on a couple of things from about 2001 to about 2007, uh, right. including and culminating with the sale to tax in Shinawatra. So in reality, you've had a big part, to play, or maybe big or small, however you want to describe it, you've played your part in the hands of Manchester City or football club ending up in the hands of Sheikh Mansour, effectively. Yeah, well, I, like, I mean, many many stepping I, stones in between there, but I, you were. I like, I, like to, I like to think I was there when we were scrambling around, and I yeah. Like, but uh, just to be survive. clear, you have no involvement now, and uh, since no, Sheikh Mansour, I, I you've had no I involvement, had any now, involvement now. for a long time. So my interest now, uh, obviously, I'm you know very interested in football generally, but football finance uh, as it's as it sort of emerged as uh, a major um, point of interest uh, you know my expertise has sort of been uh, called upon by by various people um, and you know the complexity means that my combination of uh, I'm a qualified lawyer uh, experienced in litigation but also have a good understanding of the numbers Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm well placed to uh, help people understand exactly what's going on, um, yeah. and it's you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty complicated. Yeah, uh, so exactly. Yeah. Like I said, I've been portrayed as an expert on this channel by some people in the comments. It couldn't be further from the truth, um, which is why I've brought you on, Stefan, and I'm uh, very happy and. It's a pleasure to have you on as well. But let's get into it now, mate, because why, why do you think FFP was brought in in the first place, considering the timing of it with factoring in Chelsea, Abramovich, and then, of course, followed by Sheikh Mansour and Manchester City? Is it those two clubs as to why financial fair play was brought in to begin with? Look, it's not a simple answer. So if you go back, uh, this is an area that Nick Harris in particular would think that he has a strong point. Uh, th there is no question that there was a period towards the end of the uh, the 2000s where there was a concern generally around Europe as to the sustainability of the game generally. And it, they were right to have that concern. It particularly existed in relation to debt and in relation to what happens when an owner decides that he no longer wishes to or no longer is able to continue to financially support the club. And, and to be perfectly frank, City could well have had that problem. 
before the sale to Taxi Shinawatra, one of the key drivers that we had in 2006, 2007, was the fact that the owners had put in a huge amount of money over the years and didn't have an appetite to continue to do that. And therefore, we needed to find somebody who had deeper pockets to be able to compete with teams who were qualifying for the Champions League. And that discrepancy was causing teams that were outside of that group to spend heavily to compete. At the same time, you had money coming in in the Russian League, uh, and also there was an emergence of the Chinese League, which were having a distorting effect upon the finances of the game. So there was a perfectly legitimate reason why UEFA would want to try and put in rules that would try and temper and uh, increase the ability of the clubs to self-control themselves. Um, that was perfectly reasonable, and that's what what that's how kind of the whole idea around financial fair play started. The problem is, as it's emerged over the years, or as it's developed over the years, in as with any situation where you have multiple companies, um, and particularly in sport, battling over the prizes, they're going to start looking out for self interest. And what you can see very clearly over those years is that certain clubs were very reluctant to allow the gravy train of Champions League football in particular to be shared amongst other clubs and would therefore do anything possible to make sure that they could uh, increase their chances of qualification for the Champions League. And as it happens... There's nothing wrong with that from a competitive perspective. I would fully expect all clubs to fight their corner as hard as possible uh, and try and form rules that work for them. So a club that has incredibly high levels of debt clearly is not going to want to support restrictions on high levels of debt. Uh, Likewise, teams that want huge amounts of equity investment during a growth period, call them the ambitious clubs, as I saw and described as today in, in an article, uh, you know, the sorts of, in, in these days, uh, Aston Villa or Newcastle, clearly those clubs are going to want a different form of financial fair play. So what's happened over the years is that the rules have evolved and at each turn, uh, where a new kind of way of approaching um, the, the development of a squad, be that... Uh, money coming in, say, from the Far East or related party transactions. Wherever there's been a new way of doing business uh, that other clubs have felt was a threat to them, they've moved very quickly to put in place new rules to, to temper that. There is an overriding, I would happily accept there is an overriding view that there needs to be regulation to to help with sustainability of the game generally. That's yeah. fine. But then overlaying that is clubs fighting for their own positions and protecting their own positions. And the two things, you know, they can almost be separated uh, in terms of the analysis. One is, I mean, they're both legitimate to an extent. You know, it's legitimate for any individual club to fight their own corner and create where they're given a vote on something to to create the rules that work for them. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's just the way of the world. And likewise, it's legitimate for the overall uh, regulator, be that UEFA, the Premier League, or whoever else, to create a regime that protects the game as a whole. Mm-hmm. So, so the, 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 the intentions are noble. What, what's happened, though, I would say, is that we've ended up with a kind of Frankenstein regime, which uh, it can't ever work for everybody. But the question really is, is it working? Is it working generally? And, Mm. you know, I mean, everybody can have their own view on that. I mean, there seems to be a feeling that since the Everton case, um, that, that some things are missed. But the reality is these rules have been in place for over 10 years. I mean, I wrote when Everton were one of the clubs voting in favour of these things. I, you can go back and have a look at my tweets from 2013. You know, I was, I, 
I was telling Everton how insane they were voting through rules that were bound to restrict their ability to compete over time. The same with Villa. Uh, you know, Newcastle, I don't even know if Newcastle may not have been in the Premier League when they voted for them, but all these clubs that are now complaining about it lined up to support the regime that was brought in. I don't know how United, Arsenal, Liverpool, Spurs and these teams convinced some of the clubs who were not in the Champions League. I don't know how they convinced them to vote in favour, but they did. And now they're suffering the consequences. Mm. Um, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with uh, with, with the, the PSR rules as they are now. I mean, £105 million pounds plus all of the allowances should have made people comply with those rules. I mean, it's not that difficult to comply. Mm. You just have to stop spending. I mean, it's quite easy to see, for example, why Everton failed. Forget the stadium. They failed because their wage bill has been too high for too long. And similarly with Leicester City, if you were to analyse Leicester's situation, the wage bill was at a dangerous level. And, and when they then ended up getting relegated, that clearly is going to lead to problems. Um, Nottingham Forest. We know why not, Nottingham, I, I keep saying Notts Forest, apparently that's a massive... It offends them, that does, yeah. They're massively, massively offended. But, but yeah. I apologise <laughs> if there happens to be a Nottingham Forest fan listening. Yeah. Um, Nottingham Forest, we'll see probably in the next 24 hours a bit more detail about their case, but they failed because they overspent on players in the transfer market. It's not that complicated. If you don't want to fail, don't overspend. Have you, have you seen any other industries or any other walks of life, considering you, you, I imagine you've delved into lots of different industries with regards to finance? Um, have you ever seen any sort of restrictions been put in place like this in other industries? Because it only see I've, I've never really known. I know there's the no, anti-competitive yeah. law and things like that, but that's not really the same thing. In saying you can't, you, you can only spend what you've earned. It was as FFP once was known, and now you're at a certain threshold over three year periods under PSR. Um, have you ever seen anything like this in any other no, industry? No, yeah. I mean clearly there's nothing similar to this. But then again, you know, sport does hold a slightly unique position. So, um, uh, you know, I, I would say sport sort of sit and football sit between this sort of extreme that we have in terms of media ownership and media restrictions. We see there are going to be a whole load of new rules that prevent people like Sheikh Mansour and his consortium with Redbird buying the Telegraph newspaper or, or continuing to own the Telegraph newspaper. And then at the other extreme, the kind of free market, complete, you know, do what you like. Uh, the Amazons of this world are allowed to lose billions and billions of pounds in the pursuit of long-term profit. Mm. Um, football sits somewhere in that middle. You know, it's not such an important asset that it that we need to restrict the ownership away from uh, external players that might want to, you know, kind of uh, dictate a uh, thoughts or policies in the way that we would with the media. But likewise, people, I think rightly, to an extent, want to say we need to protect football. It, it's, it's more than just a business that, oh, well, if it goes bust, who cares? You know, we'd all say that these are important national assets, um, local assets, heritage assets that need some level of protection such that they don't go pop. You know, mm. nobody wants a Berry situation. No. Uh, even if Berry happen in a particular um, set of circumstances to have run themselves very poorly financially and go bust. I mean, that's not good for the game. It's not, there's very few people who would not want any restriction if it meant loads of clubs were going to go bust. Mm. So, you know, I, so of course there aren't, other rules around for, for other businesses, but football and sport is unusual. And of course, now we've got the PSR rules that are changing again. 
So, uh, what's do you know what's to come with that? Is it anything to do with the lack of spending during the January transfer market that we just witnessed, where no club would dare to put their hands in the pockets, their own pockets, to spend money out of fear of being in breach of these uh, or, or receiving a similar sort of punishment like Everton? Yeah, because you've got a situation where there's a, you know, one of the best things about uh, uh, football. Uh, or that gets people talking. I'm not sure it's one of the best things, but is that you know it's the transfer market, and everybody loves mm. the idea of signing a new player and what that means for the team and all of that sort of stuff. So, if you then destroy that sort of big part of the game, you're going to have a problem yeah. <laughs> in terms of levels of interest and uh, you know social media interactions yeah. and engagement and everything else. And it's boring playing. for people like me. I can't. I can't make any videos during January well, transfer yeah. because the, you have, yeah. well, you end up getting people like me, you know, giving you really dry, uh, dry podcasts like this, or, 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 or <laughs> informative, yeah, informative, right? Versus something that's all about, oh my god, here we go, signing a new fantastic player. Of course, that's much more interesting. Nobody wants to hear from accountants and lawyers. Um, uh, it, during the transfer window show. I mean, you know, I was literally in the studio with Jim White on transfer deadline day, uh, yeah. uh, you know, on talk sport. I mean, that's a wild situation mm. that we've got ourselves into. Um, now, does that mean that the rules change because of that? Well, actually, no. I mean, the reality is that UEFA have brought in rules to change uh, the, the system. Um you know, the, the last year and, and they were planned the year before. So the system that's coming in is, first of all, it's unclear, but it is, is different from what we've heard about. And we'll, we'll, have, we'll have to see the implications. The likelihood is, though, the idea that it's going to let certain teams off the hook is wrong. I mean, the teams that are most likely to breach PSR as we sit here now uh, for the current season, the teams that are closest to breaching are Villa, Wolves, Newcastle, Chelsea, all of those teams will have a problem under the new regime, even if it's only the squad control test that's brought in. So um, the rules are changing, but but people shouldn't get the idea that that it's all you know it's all over for 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 restrictions around uh, PSR and similar sorts of um, uh, sort of tests. Mm-hmm. All it is is a different test, and we don't even know exactly what that test looks like. Mm. Now, and the other very big dif- um, difference between what's going to come in in the Premier League and the UEFA rule is that these Premier League cases and also the e- EFL cases, they all have now established that if you breach spending rules, the only sanction that is reasonable is an immediate points deduction. And that there's, there's the, the sporting advantage that you get from uh, these uh, breaches are so serious that you get a sporting advantage, uh, even if you can't say exactly what that sporting advantage was, and therefore it has to be a sporting sanction, i.e. points and not a transfer ban or a fine. And that's really serious because no team... It's very hard if you're a a team that's thinking or or a management team or or, or an executive team that's thinking about breaching financial fair play of some sort to bring in more players. Very hard to do that if you don't know what the penalty is going to be because you could expose yourself to six, nine points of deduction and all of a sudden you've gone from being safe in a relegation battle to being very likely relegated or at the other end of the table... One minute you think you're in the driving seat for a Champions League place, and the next minute you, you're scraping around to try and get into the Europa Conference. Mm. And these are massive differences, you know, especially after the change next year. There's going to be about 30% uplift in the Champions League revenue mm. compared to where we are today. And um, that's going to mean that the difference between the Champions League and the Europa League is massive and is is completely, you know, almost beyond compare to the Europa Conference. And then clearly, if you haven't got any of those things, you're going to be, you know, the difference next year between City, City's Champions League 
in the likelihood that City get at least to the quarters, because, you know, generally that's what we're doing these days. You're talking about something like a difference between City and let's say, let's say Chelsea don't qualify for anything. In next year's revenue, City are going to have an advantage of something like 170 million euros. I mean, it's an extraordinary amount. Chelsea's mm. entire revenue next season is probably, if they didn't qualify for the for Europe, would probably be about 410 million pounds. And the, and City would be getting something like, even in a worst case, something like 150 million pounds from Europe that Chelsea won't get. So you mm-hmm. sort of see the, the power that that gives you, uh, you know, in terms of being able to spend and not, not breach. Yeah. And, and we haven't even talked about what that looks like for a Newcastle or an Aston Villa, you know, where their, their revenues are, aren't even anywhere close to 400. You know, those, those guys are down at 300. Mm-hmm. And so what if they compete against uh, a team in the Champions League that's bringing in, you know, 150 million pounds, worst case? So with this being intended to protect the clubs is what you're telling me basically that the um the gap is effectively getting bigger between top and bottom um that sounds anti-competitive to me that doesn't sound good for the sport that sounds like the regulations aren't working and to, it's anti-investment is it not because surely if you're a new if you're a new uh, or an interested party that wants to invest in a football club Surely you're being put off by these regulations. You're saying, well, how can I not spend any of my money? Well, no, you can't. No, you can't because, you know, th- these regulations are in place. Well, how do you grow? Is there any alternatives out there? Do, just for you, for you, Stefan, asking you the question, would you propose any alternative to FFP or the regulations that could still see the, the protection in place, but also allow new football clubs or new ownership models to come in, invest, and still have a fair crack at it to get to the top. Mm. I mean, look, I think the most, the, the the best idea probably is to allow new owners a period of investment where the rules are relaxed, such that they have a kind of two year period in which they can overspend under the rules, providing yep. they've put in the necessary additional money so that there's no real risk. So, for example, if you were to have somebody that goes in and says, well, I'm going to spend, I'm going to commit the club to £200 million of transfers and £300 million of wages over the next five years, right? And I'm going to commit Mm. to that. Well, if I'm an owner, I'm prepared to put a bond in for that full amount such that the club has no risk of, uh, you know, financial trouble going forward. And that feels like it could work. Yeah. Is that fair? Well, it's not really fair on the teams that haven't got the 500 million. So yeah, exactly. it just yeah. creates another problem. This is why I say the idea of creating a one-size-fits-all regime is almost impossible. Mm. So for everyone that's a winner, there's a loser somewhere. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. Allowed, it's around the same sorts of argument around sporting advantage. Mm. So you know, when we see uh, Everton or Nottingham Forest or Leicester are arguing, oh, well, we we didn't, you know, we shouldn't have a points penalty. And, and you know, there's a case in point with with Everton fans. Everton sent something like a 50-page submission from their fans um, saying it's not fair to penalise the fans for the overspending. Um, you know, why, why, why should you penalise the fans when it's been an overspending by the owners? But the problem that that misses is that in the appeal board was not able to hear from all of the fans that were disadvantaged. So Everton finished in the play, in fourth bottom last season. Well, you need to hear from Leeds fans. You need to hear from Leicester mm-hmm. fans. You need to hear from Southampton fans because I'm damn sure they thought they were disadvantaged in in sporting advantage terms. So it's not a zero sum game. No. You know, at the end of the day, if you've had an advantage, the likelihood is that somebody has had a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, I like the idea. I like you, to be honest, giving you that little window to sort of get a foothold into the into the football pyramid and allowed to invest. That's not a bad idea, but it's, uh, 
it still doesn't fit everyone, does it? Because those that are not receiving investment whatsoever, they're going to be saying, well, now they're further ahead and that gap's grown between me and them. So, uh, yeah, it's not an easy one, is it? Now, moving on to Manchester City specifically and the 115 charges, the simplest of questions, really, that I think most people, sadly not all, understand now but can you quickly clear up the oversimplification of City's case versus Everton and Forest? Well they're, they're completely different cases I mean City's yeah. case is in in essence is an allegation that for a period of 10 years City's accounts have been materially false and the contracts that were entered into with people like Etihad uh, were not what they said they were, and they were actually much smaller contracts. And City, uh, effectively, this is the allegation, effectively uh, had sham agreements with those organisations such that City recognised, let's say, £60 million in their accounts when actually those contracts were for £8 million. Um, and therefore, all of City's accounts for about 10 years are materially false. Now, there are all sorts of other bits and pieces around the edges on that, for Yaya Torre and Mancini, mm -hmm. but at the nub of it is that City's accounts are, are false. And, um, and um, that's an allegation that clearly is incredibly serious. And if you go around making incredibly serious allegations, those, uh, th those uh, who are alleged to have um, committed those um, those fraudulent transactions must be given proper time to defend themselves and for the case to take the, the, the time that it takes. Um, now, that's very different from a effectively a simple breach of a £105 million limit and the arguments around mitigation and aggravation around that that simple breach. And mm. that's why, for example, I mean, even forgetting the Everton case, if you look at the Nottingham Forest case, the Nottingham Forest case, the, the hearing in itself, first of all, Nottingham Forest admitted a 105 breach, right? So that was easy. So yeah. they don't need to decide whether they breached, they breached. And then there was only two days, probably actually one and a half days of deliberations over the aggravating and mitigating factors that will then go into to, um, uh, you know, effectively um, establish what the penalty should be. Uh, you know, one and a half days. I mean, you're probably talking about, you know, not much more than about 10 hours of, of actual um, submission in that hearing. The cities is going to take weeks. I mean, the, the seriousness of the allegations and the the extent of the allegations over the number of years that they've been alleged and the number of uh, individuals who are said to have been involved and the number of other peripheral matters around it, this will take a very, very long time to, to, uh, to go through within that mini trial. Hmm. And clearly, if you've got a very long trial, for want of a better word, hearing, whatever you want to call it, clearly, if you're going to have a very long trial, one, you're going to have huge numbers of documents involved. So if you look to Everton's first case, which again was a simple case, that had something like 30,000 documents in that case. But if you have a very long case, what it means is that there's a huge amount of preparation that takes place. Mm. So if you read, this case is similar to a very serious case in the High Court. And a very serious case in the High Court would take two, three years to come to trial. And in that period in advance, people would be swapping documents, preparing witnesses, preparing for the trial, preparing their submissions at the trial, and generally getting ready for very, very serious allegations. Because, you know, you make no mistake, if these allegations are proven, then they're very, very damaging for the people that are involved. And mm. obviously for City, there's no... You know, even City would accept that. And, and City did accept that because the case is in many ways similar to the Cass case. And I, you know, I'm, I always trot out the, um, the, the, the line in there around um, if 
if their case theory, if UEFA's case theory had been correct, it would have meant that City would have lied to many, many parties over many, many years. And there's no way around that. You know, that is the finding that this court, this tribunal, will have to come to um, if they want to find against City. And it is a very, very big call to do that. I've got a quote for you here, Stefan, actually, and it's quoting you. I can quote you back. So, um, City are being accused of falsifying their books, conspiring with a multitude of executives from other companies and state personnel. They've misled investors. They've persuaded CAS personnel into perjuring themselves and persuaded multiple auditors to turning a blind eye. Those are your words, Stefan. Uh, so with that being said, do you believe that City are guilty and do you believe they'll be found guilty? Two separate questions. Well, in terms of whether whether they are guilty, starting point, I don't mean to dodge the question, but the reality is nobody from the outside knows. Um, but of course, and this will be the starting point of any court or tribunal looking at this, it is highly unlikely that the conduct that is alleged took place. Um, that is the starting point in any of these sorts of cases that come up in in civil um, in civil litigation. Um, there is an assumption that generally people do not act in in the manner in which is alleged in this case, uh, i.e., <laughs> that they have conspired to to create false accounts over many years. That that, that is an assumption that people don't usually do that. Um, now, clearly, nothing is impossible. Um, you know that the, the the evidence will have to be tested by the tribunal, uh, and clearly, if in the extreme situation that all of that, uh, all of those allegations are proven, then clearly there can be no question that the punishment will be very severe, uh, because because it is so unlikely, because. Uh, there is a presumption that people don't act in such a um, in such a way. Then clearly, if City have done what is alleged, then clearly the punishment will have to be very strong. I think it is very unlikely, and I've said this from the very first day. I think it is unlikely that this is a forum that will be able to establish such serious conduct um, and misconduct um, and. Uh, that can either be because it didn't occur or simply because the forum itself, i.e. an independent uh, commission, is simply not able to establish to the level of necessary legal standard that that these things occurred. Uh, and effectively, that's what happened at CAS. I mean, the case wasn't quite the same in that uh, I think the Independent Commission will have more documentary evidence than CAS, uh, but ultimately it was very clear that uh, CAS recognised that, that they were being asked to uh, call a number of people liars, that they were being asked to say that per people perjured themselves, that they were being asked to establish that City over many years had... Uh, had created false accounts, and CAS found that it did not have the evidence to make such serious findings. And uh, we will see, but it would seem to me unlikely that an independent commission is going to be able to establish uh, such serious misconduct. Which sounds good news for City fans, in truth, um, but we will have to wait and see. It does seem like there's a, um, a perception of Manchester City's owners leaving a trail of brown paper bags behind them where every single person that they've come across has been paid off in some way or another, um, which totally, it doesn't sound feasible whatsoever, not plausible. Um, with that being said, another myth going on around Manchester City is the fact, obviously, we have no fans is another one. But tying into the fact that the, the the smaller fan base, we do have a smaller fan base compared to the likes of Real Madrid and United, one that is growing, mind you, with the success that we're having 
on the field. That is a very likely that gap's going to close pretty soon. But uh, a perception around City as well is because we have no fans, we therefore generate no revenue. Can you clear up the difference in revenue that's generated by a fan compared to revenue generated by sponsorship deals and why the fact that City can have such a monstrous revenue yet still have a smaller, still very large, but smaller fan base than United and Real Madrid, for example? Well, look, there's there's effectively three elements to uh, the revenue of any football club, and um, you know a, a very large proportion of it, in any event, is is not even coming from um, directly from the fans. And, you know, so we're now in a situation where broadcast revenue within a top club. I mean, I, I spoke to you earlier about the situation um, with next year's. Um, Champions League being worth probably some somewhere in the order of 150 absolute minimum. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just if you got to the quarterfinals. If you got to the final uh, or you won it, it's going to be worth something like 200 million euros probably versus about 140 that we had last year. That's none of that is anything to do with fans, right? So yeah. that's that's just pure broadcast revenue. Um, so if you look at cities. Uh, profit and loss account. Um, so in, in for the year just gone, 22-23, City's turnover was just over 700 million. But 300 million of it was broadcasting. Okay? So almost half of the total turnover was nothing to do with number of fans per se. Mm-hmm. Um, commercial revenue... Uh, was contrary to the the sort of stuff that we heard on uh, on the overlap was a, a big number. Don't get me wrong, but it was not the biggest in Europe. Uh, in fact, it was fifth, uh, smaller than Bayern Munich, smaller than PSG, um, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the idea that um, it's completely implausible that City could generate uh, 340 million pounds uh, of um, of commercial revenue is again a, a nonsense. Now it is possible that people could argue that certain of the contracts are either uh, uh, more than they could be, more than say the underbidder would be prepared to pay. But there's important caveats to that. First of all, the club did win the treble and also won the Club World Cup. There can be no question that in terms of positive brand association, that the City uh, Association is a positive one. Uh, It's with winners and everything and all of that, everything that flows from that. It is also true that there's huge amount of engagement and um, and uh, sort of coverage of any brand associated with the club. It's also part of a multi-club uh, group with major uh, clubs in uh, major capital cities and other major cities around the world. And moreover, the rules that have now been in place for quite some time mean that The ability of clubs anyway to have deals that are more than fair market value is pretty much uh, impossible um, because of the way the disclosures and the testing that's required by the league uh, is required. So any any contract over a million pounds with an associated party, an associated party is a very widely drawn concept within the Premier League rules. Any contract over £1 million needs to be tested with the Premier League. So I think it's very hard to argue that the uh, commercial revenue is materially inflated. And I would add that, of course, City's head of um, sponsorship and a big part of the commercial growth in the club has just been appointed by Manchester United to be the CEO. Um, and the idea that if City, sorry, if United 
had major doubts about um, the work of uh, Omar Barada at City in respect of the commercial growth of the club, uh, that they would then appoint him to be the chief executive and a main board director of a publicly listed company in New York, yeah. I think is fanciful. And um, so, look, those are the those are the key line. You know, the, the commercial line is the key line where people will say, "How can it possibly be the case that?" Well, you know, you can ask the same question about uh, Bayern Munich, PSG, um, and a number of other clubs, and ultimately. Uh, you know, we can look at it through the prism of uh, thinking only about uh, Premier League clubs and Premier League clubs that were successful in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. But the world's moved on a bit, you know, um, and there is uh, City clearly on any measure are a very fast growing uh, media proposition um, and particularly so outside of the UK and mm. um I think it's a bit of a nonsense to, to sort of have this comparison uh, based purely on what people who support United and Liverpool say um, in Cork. What you said there, fair market value is an interesting topic. You beat me to it but as well by stating about the... Um, any sort of uh, associated parties, in other words, what the layman would describe as Sheikh Mansour's best mate sponsoring Manchester City or getting family members to sponsor Manchester City, those sort of deals that went on. Uh, first of all, fair market value, isn't that more in the subjective um, ballpark, as in how do you determine what is fair market value? And wouldn't the sponsors um, now have a very good claim at saying, well, hang on a minute, we we looked at Manchester City's projection and what they were expecting to do on the field. We sponsored them however long ago and Manchester City have gone on to do things that no other football clubs have ever done on the field. And therefore we've been backed by investing maybe a bit more than everyone else, but we've still, you know, we've been backed by the success and now we're associated with that success that we, uh, we made the right call to do that. Well, look, we don't know the uh, the ins and outs of, of each individual um, uh, agreement. I, I would say that it's very clear that that the growth of Etihad, for example, as an airline, has been assisted by their association uh, with City, uh, with with that sponsorship deal, um, and with that marketing cost, uh, as an example. Um, now. I don't know how much testing goes on. I don't know who the underbidders are on any of these uh, proposals. Um, but, but the new rules, I can tell you now, require a huge amount of disclosure to the Premier League in respect of the whole process, including declarations from directors of the sponsors as to their belief in fair market value and their belief in terms of, uh, uh, so, sorry, not their belief, their understanding and their aspirations in respect of each agreement. So if if uh, there has been issues historically with some of this stuff, those those deals will not be able to continue. So we will see. There was an Eti Salat guy um, who gave evidence to, um, to to Cass on this very point? And um, I mean, there's two there's two aspects to this. First of all, uh, neither of Eti Salah or Eti Had's deals with City were said to be anything other than fair value at Cass. So UEFA never suggested that that those agreements were not fair value. That just simply was not the the argument at Cass. And we do. We also know that historically, when UEFA market tested the Etihad value, they believed that they were fair market value. But in on top of that, contrary to popular understanding of the of what happened at Cas, although Etihad the the issues around Etihad were uh, time barred, there wasn't there was evidence given. Uh, before it was established that they were time barred, uh, 
Um, there was evidence given by uh, a witness on behalf of Etty Salat, and uh, he said that the sponsorship of MCFC delivered excellent returns, and these are his words, providing direct benefits for Etty Salat in 16 different markets and consistently outperforming our evaluations of the returns on sponsorship. So he was very clear that uh, that they sounds had, like a happy customer. Well, I, I mean, I think that's a good way to describe it. Now, I've got no idea who Mister Harib of Eti Salah is, uh, mm. but there was no suggestion that he was not telling the truth at Cass, and um, and his evidence therefore must be accepted. Um, mm. uh, and so, look, we'll see. There's um, a, a, a particular man who's uh, been on the tips of Manchester City fans' tongue, really, in the talk of uh, bribing, or hacking rather. Rui Pinto is a historic figure in the Cass case. Does he have any involvement in this case whatsoever? Is any of the information that he hacked being carried over into this case, or is his, his involvement completely nothing to do with the Premier League charges? Well, he won't need to be involved because the reality is the Premier League will have access to huge amounts of information. I mean, the, the Premier League rules allow um, they allow uh, the Premier League to get Premier League information uh, to get information out of the clubs. I mean, that is that is a fundamental right uh, of them, and therefore they don't need Rui Pinto. Rui Pinto gave them sufficient grounds to open an investigation. Uh, but his role is now irrelevant. Last question for you, Stefan. And I know you believe that City are going to be—they're going to struggle to find Manchester City guilty, and you don't believe that they will be found guilty because of that. Um, if they were, I've already—I already know that your answer is that relegation is the punishment. Following on from that, and in the hypothetical scenario that Manchester City are found guilty and have been relegated, we would then be given the opportunity to appeal that decision. One, what do you reckon in terms of the duration of an appeal? And if we are now spending football minutes in the championship, playing football where we've once been before, but we then win our appeal and have the verdict overturned, what then? Do we just get put back into the Premier League? And how how do they work out that middle ground? of? Because we've seen Everton get punished 10 points already. Um, And if they won that appeal completely, and I mean, it's a different scenario, I understand that. But how are are the Premier League working out the punishments and the the fact that an appeal can quickly follow and change everything? Well, look, there's an enormous problem with with anything that flows from this. Nobody knows, first of all, right? So that's the first thing to say, right? We're all on mass speculation. Um, I would think that in a case as serious as the City one, the likelihood is that the penalty would have to be suspended pending appeal. Because I just can't see how you can have a situation where just working a scenario, let's say in June, somehow in June of 2025, there's a verdict. And let's say bad news, okay, for us. And, uh, and and the, the recommendation is whatever, uh, points deduction or relegation or, I mean, you know, you've got straight away, you've got a question if it was a points deduction. Let's say it was a 100-point de- deduction for the sake of discussion. Well, which season are we saying it applies? Are we saying that it applies to the season just gone or the season that they're in? Or is it in the, the subsequent season? If it's in the subsequent season such that it makes the whole season completely irrelevant because you couldn't do anything but, but get relegated, then are we really saying that City have to play through an entire season with that uh, hanging over them? Or do we say, well, uh, it's like the Everton situation where there's an asterisk and, and you... You have you start with a minus a hundred, and at some point during the season, we'll have the appeal, and maybe or maybe not, we'll have the judgment. Well, nobody yeah. knows. So, it, 
I can't answer the question. Is the sim? Is the no, sim? Yeah, and uh, it feels like you can't because it feels because like they're making it up as they go knows. along. Yeah. They haven't. They haven't figured it out themselves. And, and you exactly. have to remember that almost the best case scenario for the Premier League that they win the case that they brought is a disaster for the Premier League. Mm-hmm. You know that's the crazy situation that they've got themselves into. That yeah. even if they win, they got a massive problem on their hands. Yeah. Which is great news for City, and it's uh, uh, basically a game of chicken now, isn't it? Dare to pull the trigger, Premier League, and see what happens. Well, they have pulled it. I mean, in fairness, uh, they have pulled the trigger. I mean, re- remember, when you pull the trigger, you then hand it over to an independent commission and an appeal, mm-hmm. if there's an appeal. So what happens once you make the charges that they've made is that you become, the Premier League becomes the claimant. So if you were to look at the decision that, that's been made in the Everton case, and that we'll get probably today on the Nottingham Forest case, it will say at the top, claimant, Premier League, okay? Yeah. And the parties then become adversarial in front of an independent commission and an appeal board. So as soon as you bring those charges and you bring it to an independent commission, you have pulled the trigger, and you can't then control the outcome that easily because... The, the obligation on the claimant, uh, 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 the obligation of the Premier League as a claimant is to really fight as hard as they can in that independent commission. You saw it with the Everton case. You know, that they were asking for 12 points. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and you can bet your bottom dollar that their barristers as well are going to fight as hard as possible to, to win the case that they brought. So mm. it's a dangerous move. I mean, they've, but they've made the move. I mean, I wrote an article in the daily in the mail on sunday um in august 21 that that really explained the difficult situation the premier league was in here and how the best alternative was to find a way to to settle it out and not to take it to this to this uh, sort of next level and they didn't do it and now they've got mm. themselves into a situation where they have a big big problem yeah, the, the the ongoing image of Manchester City would then be followed by um, uh, we paid them off, wouldn't they? If it's if it's an out of court settlement, I think we would be forever tarnished with that word cheat as someone who's paid off the Premier League to go quiet all of a sudden. Yeah, it would um, be very very hard for them to deal with that from an optics perspective. It's now impossible for them to do it. I would say because of that, because of the problem you just articulated. But I think it would have been very difficult for them to do it before the charges but Hmm. it's when you when you're running a league when you're in richard master's position you have to look at the least worst outcome and yes they may well have taken quite a lot of um uh, innuendo and abuse for settling with city on a commercial basis but ultimately they have to protect uh the, the commercial value of the league and they've risked that this situation yeah. and the way that they've dealt generally with this the PSR um, situation, they've risked it. And partly they've risked it because they articulated it themselves from a PR perspective so poorly. I mean, mm. you know, the Everton situation in particular, they, they, they took a hammering. When, when in reality, if you were to read the appeal board and, and read the independent commission, the Premier League didn't do very much wrong. And actually, the Premier League were extremely lenient towards Everton. But you'd never get that from uh, from the way it played out in the media. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they, you know, they, it, these are complicated issues. That's why this whole uh, video is, is probably been much drier than anything you've ever produced. Um, it's not. It's been informative. I, I, I must say, Stefan, that I feel better as a City fan, and I'm hoping the Blues who are watching. Uh, the Blues of Manchester, that is, of course, um, feel better having watched this because you've put my mind at ease. I certainly don't think it's a foregone conclusion one way or the other. Who knows when we're talking about the Premier League who seem to be making it up as they go along. Um, But bottom line seems to be that it's very favourable towards Manchester City's side uh, and very problematic for the Premier League to resolve this situation and come out where both parties in Manchester City and the Premier League smelling of roses. Um, I can't see that. I feel like there could be some damage to to one party or another. Um, from what you've said and the the 
the allegations being so huge and the difficulty in proving that, it sounds very favourable to Manchester City from what you've what you've said, Stefan. Um, and I really appreciate your time, by the way, as well. Really, really appreciate it. You've been fantastic. I know you've called yourself dry. I call it informative. I call it informative and you've been fantastic. Anyone who's interested in uh, following Stefan, he's very active on Twitter. I highly recommend going what, uh, following him on Twitter. SLBSN is his Twitter handle. Go and give him a follow. He's constantly updating the uh, his Twitter account with information like this and not just City as well the accounts of other uh, Premier League football clubs really interesting Twitter account to follow so I definitely recommend going doing that um, and yeah once again Stefan thank you so much for, for joining me first ever guest on the channel as well so uh, re- yeah brilliant I'm glad you're honoured mate um, yeah definitely weren't dry I really enjoyed talking to you mate it was uh, it was really really good Blues, if you're watching this now after the fact, drop a comment in the comment sections below. I want to hear your thoughts on this. How do you see this panning out going forward? Drop a like as well. Like and subscribe to Typical City, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Typical City now. Holding up silver.